Pepsi Watson, Crime and Justice TV, episode three of my CJTV series reflections. So I'm just over the road from my house here. I'm on Streatham Common, South London. As you can see from the camera, you can see I'm over here on the common. You've got people walking their dogs, a few little kids running around playing with kites. There's a guy over to the left off camera, you can't see him, but he's, uh, he's actually doing what I believe to be Tai Chi. You see a dog there just in the camera, having fun, running around or walking at the moment. So yeah, I've had a super busy week. So it's actually quite nice to come over here and just breathe, take it in. I love this area of London, I'm just embracing it. I really enjoy living here. It's multicultural, diverse. I've met the local councillor. He came around to fix my computer. Really nice bloke. I've met all sorts of different nice people. Great city, greatest city, greatest city on earth, London. Amazing place. So yeah, like I said, I've had a super busy week. I've been up to Rampton High Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire to visit Sean Thomas, the partially deaf lad with a speech impediment who's been incarcerated for 14 years. I also met a solicitor advocate by the name of Kush. Exceptional character treated me to lunch, went to a lovely English country pub, had a lovely English meal. It really was like, you know, it was, it was, oh, just, it was the greatest moment I've had since I've been out, I think. I just felt so free. Been in London a few weeks. You know, I haven't got as many restrictions as I did have in the hostel. And I've been so busy studying and shooting videos and getting settled into London it was just uh, it was like like a nice little holiday really and to meet such a lovely warm humble knowledgeable man who is so passionate about helping others from marginalized groups was just inspirational really so really good trip to Nottingham so this week there's been a horrendous terror attack in New Zealand where this deranged right-wing fanatic walked into a mosque and massacred people with automatic weapons and I've been thinking about it a lot since it happened and I spoke in my well I've spoken two of my other videos on my channel about my opinions regarding homegrown terrorism and the psych the psychological makeup, the psych, the mindset of the, the people who perpetrate these acts against their own country where they were born or against countries where they've spent the majority of their lives and the fact that the police and the prison service in this country haven't got a grip on, on the psychological makeup of these people. I also spoke about my opinions and conclusions about these men in the sense that they are men who hate themselves and have extreme feelings of low self-worth and self-loathing and that those feelings are so intense and extreme that they then project it outwards into the society that they live in. So I was incarcerated in HMP Wayland for a number of years, which was the prison where Khalid Massoud was radicalised, the Westminster Bridge attacker. I was also in Feltham Young Offenders Institution when I was 15 years old and 16 years old, which is the, the prison where the shoe bomber Richard Reed was also radicalised. I also spoke in one of my other videos about being on G-Wing in Wayland, where young men from London who were damaged, um, very vulnerable, marginalized, 
who used to go to the mosque and discuss bomb plots in the capital. And this stuff was going on in Wayland Prison when I was there in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. So what makes a person commit such heinous acts? What makes a person harm others? Whether it's terrorism or otherwise. So I'm going to read you some testimony that I've got here. It's very interesting. It's actually very, very insightful testimony. It's fascinating testimony. The testimony is from one of the Toronto 18, Zachariah Amara. So the Toronto 18 were men who planned to behead the Canadian Prime Minister and storm a number of buildings with automatic weapons and explosives and commit a top-end, coordinated, high-level, extreme terror attack in Canada. So this man's been incarcerated for 12 years now. He's 12 years into a life sentence in a Canadian supermax prison. Zachariah Amara, currently detained in Millhaven Maximum Security Prison in Canada. So recently, in his insightful, fascinating testimony, he said the following. If I had a noose around my neck and the only thing that could save my life was the answer to this apparently dumbfounding question, what makes people susceptible to radicalization, then I would have to say it is the emotional state of feeling utterly worthless. He then goes on to say, what happens to a person who witnesses their entire family getting wiped out by a precise missile strike? Desperate for belonging to a people in my teenage years, these are the only people I ever felt that I belonged to. And as they radicalised, I radicalised with them. Bush and Blair's 2003 invasion of Iraq and its resulting massacre of hundreds of thousands of innocent Iraqis represented for me the crossing of the radical Rubicon. You can pretty much draw a straight line from there to my arrest in 2006. How does it feel to be radical? You feel worthy, righteous and heroic. You see yourself as a saviour of your people. Your mind is obsessed with the injustices they are suffering from and that's all you wish to talk about and think about. You see the world in strictly and entirely black and white terms. Deep inside you suspect that there may be other colours which subconsciously drives you to engage in constant reinforcement of your beliefs. It is said that those who are the most dogmatic are usually the least certain. A vivid depiction of this internal struggle is that of a boy who is perpetually fortifying the walls of a sandcastle he built too close to the waves. When I arrived at the Special Handling Unit, Canada's Supermax Prison, I was willing to give change a chance for the sake of my family, but unfortunately the administrators were unresponsive. Feeling rejected once again intensified my radical state. And in fact, I became more extreme in the shoe, isolation, than I ever was outside. I adopted a standoffish attitude towards the administrators and refused meeting my parole officer for many years. Incredible, insightful testimony. So I can relate because in the past when I harmed others, I harmed others because I hated myself. I loathed myself, and the more abuse I received from prison officers in prison as a teenager, the more I became entrenched in self-loathing and the more that I hated myself. Therefore, when I was released, the more I harmed others. Somebody who loves themselves instead of hating themselves doesn't stick dirty needles in their arm and bang up smack 
somebody who loves th themselves doesn't risk a heart attack by smoking crack cocaine for four days on end whilst they watch the sun rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall four times to the point where they become psychotic. Somebody who loves themselves doesn't kill their liver with alcohol. Somebody who loves themselves doesn't not forgive others or not ask for help. Somebody who loves themselves asks for help and forgives others. Somebody who loves themselves instead of hating themselves and, lo and loathes themselves eats well, sleeps well, rests well, practices good nutrition, looks after their body. Your body is a temple. So as we heard in a testimony of this, this guy from the Toronto 18, he was obsessed with the injustices done to him and his people. He was obsessed, he could think about nothing else. He was addicted to thinking. He was totally, absolutely and completely identified with his own mind. The movie, the false mind made sense of self, an illusion, non-reality. So I'm going to read something now from Eckhart Tolle, worldwide renowned scholar, talking about addiction and love. The reason why the romantic love relationship is such an intense and universally sought after experience is that it seems to offer liberation from a deep-seated state of fear, need, lack and incompleteness that is part of the human condition in its unredeemed and unenlightened state. There is a physical as well as psychological dimension to this state. On the physical level, you are obviously not whole, nor will, you ever will, nor will you ever be. You are either a man or a woman, which is to say one half of the whole. On this level, the longing for wholeness, the return to oneness, manifests as male-female attraction. Man's need for a woman, woman's need for a man. It is an almost irresistible urge for union with the opposite energy polarity. The root of this physical urge is a spiritual one, the longing for an end to duality, a return to the state of wholeness. Sexual union is the closest you can get to this state on the physical level. This is why it is the most deeply satisfying experience the physical realm can offer. But sexual union is no more than a fleeting glimpse of wholeness, an instant of bliss. As long as it is unconsciously sought as a means of salvation, you are seeking the end of duality on the level of form, where it cannot be found. You are given a tantalizing glimpse of heaven, but you are not allowed to dwell there and find yourself again in a separate body. On the psychological level, the sense of lack and incompleteness is, if anything, even greater than on the physical level. As long as you are identified with the mind, you have an externally derived sense of self. That is to say, you get your sense of who you are from things that ultimately have nothing to do with who you are. Your social role, possessions, external appearance, successes and failures, belief systems and so on. This false mind made self, the ego, feels vulnerable, insecure and is always seeking new things to identify with to give it a feeling that it exists. But nothing is ever enough to give it lasting fulfilment. Its fear remains, its sense of lack and neediness remains. But then that special relationship comes along. It seems to be the answer to all the ego's problems and to meet all its needs. At least this is how it appears at first. All the other things that you derived your sense of self from before now become relatively insignificant. You now have a single focal point that replaces them all, gives meaning to your life and through which you define your identity, the person you are in love with. You are no longer a disconnected fragment in an uncaring universe, or so it seems. Your world now has a center, the loved one. The fact that the center is outside you and that, therefore, you still have an externally derived sense of self does not seem to matter at first. 
What matters is that the underlying feelings of incompleteness, of fear, lack and unfulfillment so characteristic of the egoic state are no longer there, or are they? Have they dissolved or do they continue to exist underneath the happy surface reality? If your relationships you experience both love and the opposite of love, if in your relationships you experience both love and the opposite of love, attack, emotional violence and so on, then it is likely that you are confusing ego attachment and addictive clinging with love. You cannot love your partner one moment and then attack him or her the next. True love has no opposite. If your love has an opposite, then it is not love but a strong ego need for a more complete and deeper sense of self, a need that the other person temporarily meets. It is the ego substitute for salvation and for a short time it almost does feel like salvation. But there comes a point when your partner behaves in ways that fail to meet your needs, or rather those of your ego. The feelings of fear, pain and lack that are an intrinsic part of egoic consciousness but have been covered up by the love relationship now resurface. Just as with every other addiction you are on a high when the drug is available but invariably there comes a time when the drug no longer works for you. When those painful feelings reappear you feel them even more strongly than before and what is more you now perceive your partner as the cause of those feelings. This means that you project them outward and attack the other with all the savage violence that is part of your pain. This attack may awaken the partner's own pain and he or she may counter your attack. At this point the ego is still unconsciously hoping that its attack or its attempts at manipulation will be sufficient punishment to induce your partner to change their behaviour so that it can use them again as a cover up for your pain. Every addiction arises from an unconscious refusal to face and move through your own pain. Every addiction starts with pain and ends with pain. Whatever the substance you are addicted to, alcohol, food, legal, illegal drugs or a person, you are using something or somebody to cover up your pain. That is why after the initial euphoria has passed there is so much unhappiness, so much pain in intimate relationships. These relationships do not cause pain and unhappiness, they bring out the pain and unhappiness that is already in you. Every addiction does that, every addiction reaches a point where it does not work for you anymore and then you feel the pain more intensely than ever. This is one reason why most people are always trying to escape from the present moment and are seeking some kind of salvation in the future. The first thing that they might encounter if they focus their attention on the now is their own pain. And this is what they fear. If they only knew how easy it is to access in the now the power of presence that dissolves the past and its pain, the reality that dissolves the illusion. If they only knew how close they are to their own reality, how close to God. So that's a lot to digest and take in. Very, very powerful words from Eckhart Tolle there. So that's what I wanted to share with you with this episode three, Reflections. And the message that I want to share to the world with this episode is one of love. And for a better world and a safer world for all of us and our families and the futures of our children, then we must learn to love ourselves and deal with our pain instead of escape it. And that's the message that I'd like to share on this episode three. So that's it from me, Pepsi Watson, Crime and Justice TV, episode three, Reflections. I hope you enjoyed. I wish you all good health, prosperity, and may you love by recognizing yourself in others.